This week on BSD Now, Chris is on vacation, so you're stuck with me. We have a recap of BSD Can and a bunch of uh, big news, and then an interview with Hans Peter Seleski. Uh, and then we will cover a bunch more stuff that happened over the week, and then we'll be back with a normal episode next week. This is BSD Now, episode 146, Music to Beastie's Ears, recorded June 15, 2016. I'm your host, Alan Jude. Chris Moore is on vacation this week. Uh, the top story in the last week, obviously, was BSD Camp, uh, which happened at the University of Ottawa in Canada, uh, and 265 people attended. Um, to start us off, OpenBSD has posted the papers and presentations that they presented, um, including Implementation of Zen uh, Paravirtualized HVM Drivers for OpenBSD by Mike Belikov. OpenBSD's RC.D system was discussed by Antoine Jacoteau. Um, Peter Hessler presented Bidirectional Forwarding Detection, a new routing protocol. And Sebastian Benoit uh, presented Open Source Routing with OpenBSD. Rake Floyter presented about SwitchD, which is an OpenFlow implementation for OpenBSD. Uh, I'd like to see about FreeBSD's website containing a similar section where all the papers are posted in a similar fashion. Uh, but in the meantime, the BSD CAN site will shortly be updated with links to all of the slides uh, in each presentation in the schedule. And then the videos once they're posted, which is expected in uh, one or two weeks or so. Uh, if you're in a big hurry, uh, Maxime Sobo, uh, I can't run it, Sobomax at freebsd.org uh, live streams some of the uh, presentations from BSD can and uh, to YouTube and there's a recording there so you can actually uh, get some of the stuff a little early by skipping around in those full day recordings of uh, the conference which are linked in the show notes. Uh, then I've uh, collected a highlighted set of social media things that happened at the conference. The first one was at the Goat Boff uh, which is a celebration of Groff the BSD Goat that happens at the pub the uh, night before the FreeBSD Dev Summit starts. And everyone who's attending BSD can has got there a little bit early, uh, which most Europeans do because time zones and so on, uh, was hanging out and having dinner and talking. And uh, Michael Lucas stood up and uh, decided to do a little presentation. He presented the Canadian version of uh, his and I's recent book, FreeBSD Mastery Advanced ZFS where on the cover, it's actually spelled out as Z-E-D-F-S. Uh, it was uh, quite amusing, and you can read more about it on his blog. But there are only five copies of the, uh, the book in that Canadian version, uh, one of which Michael kept for himself, three of which were presented to me in this video here, and the last of which um, was auctioned off as part of the, free BSD, or the uh, BSD Can charity auction, at the end of the conference and sold for over $200. Uh, some other highlighted tweets uh, we have here, pictures of uh, the previous Groff handler, um, Henning Brower, arriving at the Goat Boff with Groff. Um, and then we have uh, at the closing session of BSD Can, the FreeBSD Foundation presented uh, some people who have done important contributions to the project in the last year. Uh, their choice of a FreeBSD Foundation scarf or FreeBSD Foundation backpack. Those recognized were Brian Drury for his work on the build system, Rod Grimes, who was one of the original founders of FreeBSD and who has attended his first conference in a long time when he came to BSD CAN this year, Warren Block, who's been working on the documentation translation system and doing a lot of other work in the docs realm, and Gleb Smirnov, who's been the deputy security officer for a while now and done a bunch of other work uh, with Netflix. Uh, also, at the uh, closing social party, uh, at the uh, the final night of BSD CAN, um, there was a moment of silence and shots of Jägermeister uh, in memory of Benjamin Peralt, also known as Creeping Fur on Twitter, uh, who pa sadly passed away last year. Uh, also, as is became an unofficial tradition at BSD CAN, uh, when a couple years ago, 
um, Dan, who runs the conference, auctioned the T-shirt off of his back uh, in order to raise money for the charity. Um, George Neville Neal of the FreeBSD Foundation auctioned off his old FreeBSD Foundation shirt. Uh, the FreeBSD Foundation has changed their logo, and uh, so he has to wear the new shirt all the time now. And so he auctioned off the old one for charity. Uh, although there were competing bids on whether he should take the shirt off or keep it on, uh, and uh, taking it off was outbid or was the top bid. Um, we also have uh, during uh, the ZFS boff that happened during the lunch hour of the first day of the actual conference, uh, we were asking uh, Matt Aaron's and I uh, fielded questions and led discussions about ZFS. And uh, at some point, Michael Lucas, being uh, the Michael Lucas that he is, uh, asked Matt Ahrens about the canonical way to pronounce ZFS. And uh, Matt Ahrens commented that uh, he doesn't really matter to him how you pronounce it. And uh, Powell Doadek, who did the original port of ZFS to FreeBSD, made a comment about riser fs <laughs> and this led to the quote from matt aaron's you can pronounce zfs however you like but if you pronounce it riser fs people might be confused <laughs> i found that very amusing um ray percival who also known as scary networking guy on twitter uh wore his uh sits admin or admin spotting shirt uh, which you can go and read. Uh, it's a little not safe for work, so I'm not going to read it out to you, uh, but it's definitely worth a read if you're a uh, sysadmin or no one. Uh, interesting note, uh, Sean Chittenden from HashiCorp uh, commented about uh, the FreeBSD Vendor Summit, uh, which was part of the Dev Summit that happened the two days before the conference. Uh, unusually, one of the things we did at the beginning was actually go through and list off all the accomplishments uh, and features that actually went in to FreeBSD 11. Uh, and we had a very large set of blackboards across the front of the room, and uh, it turned out that we filled the blackboard entirely with the features that actually were added in FreeBSD 11, um, which was then followed by the usual session, which is the uh, have, want, need uh, which is where we talk about all the things that we would like to add to the next version or uh, things that vendors have that would like to upstream and so on. Uh, the interesting thing is often there's this feeling that we have this huge list of things we want and, you know, by the time it comes to the next Dev Summit, uh, again, we just have a list of things we want and we don't seem to ever make any progress. But when we filled the uh, entire set of blackboards, which you can see here, there are uh, quite a few of them, it spans the entire front of this room that seats uh, over 200 people, um, we actually filled the board with all the accomplishments we actually had. And then we almost filled it again when we started writing out the things that we want or have for FreeBSD 12. Uh, and then uh, here from the uh, ZFS boff that morning is actually uh, Matt Aaron's holding up a copy of the FreeBSD Mastery Advanced ZFS book, which I signed for him. Or, or sorry, that's the one he signed for me. Well, I am actually signing a copy for him as we traded autographs, which is quite an amusing experience. Um, and then uh, Colin Percival noted a new marketing strategy for FreeBSD, which was to, uh, if only we had worse documentation, people would post on Stack Overflow more, <laughs> uh, which was quite amusing. Uh, another item that was added to the BSD Can Charity Auction was this SystemD Whoopee Cushion, which people found quite amusing. Uh, one of the other things that happened at the Charity Auction uh, was that somebody donated a, an old Linux Symposium t-shirt, which included a quote on the back from Linus Torvalds that says, I'm an e egotistical bastard, so I name all of my projects after myself. First Linux, and now Git, uh, and so on. And so at first, the shirt wasn't really going for much on the auction. And then, uh, you know, somebody suggests burning it or something, and it wasn't really going anywhere. And then uh, someone suggested the very intelligent idea that we pay to make Henning Brower, who's an OpenBSD developer, wear it to the closing social event for the entire night. Uh, and so uh, that ended up raising $100 to force Henning to wear this Linux t-shirt for a day. Uh, then the idea was extended that if you would like to get your picture taken uh, with Henning wearing the shirt, that you would have to donate an additional $10. Uh, in total, $320 for charity was raised uh, with people getting selfies taken with Henning Brower wearing a Linux t-shirt. 
Uh, and then we piled on to Henning, uh, and another $100 was uh, donated to force Henning to put a FreeBSD, or I run FreeBSD on my laptop dog fooding sticker on his OpenBSD laptop and leave it there until the end of EuroBSDCon later this year. Uh, so in total, uh, Henning Brower raised $520 for charity by being made fun of. Uh, and then at the closing session, uh, Henning Brower handed over Groff the BSD Goat uh, to Gavin Atkinson, who is now the new handler. And um, we'll take um, Groff through uh, BSD Cambridge and then to EuroBSDCon. So that concludes our coverage of BSD Can. So now we will talk from uh, hear from our first sponsor, which is IX Systems. Uh, IX Systems provides custom-built servers uh, to meet whatever your open source server needs are, uh, including giving you fast, accurate quotes, uh, guaranteed build times, and very good burn-in testing. So when you order a machine, no matter how big or how small, uh, they are going to custom build that machine for you, not sell you something off the shelf that was already built. Uh, this means that the machine is customized for exactly your use cases, meaning you can get the features you need without the ones you don't, uh, and you can optimize for your workload. Uh, the machine is then assembled uh, very meticulously and very well. Uh, you've seen uh, pictures on previous episodes where I actually visited the uh, assembly floor where they actually put the machines together and was forced to wear fancy anti-static uh, lab coats and everything. Uh, once the machine is built, it's put through a uh, three-day burn-in testing uh, because most computer hardware, if it's going to fail, is going to fail in the first 48 hours. So by running it through 72 hours of testing, uh, they ensure they weed out any flaky hard drives or other component problems uh, before they ship the machine to you. That way, when you get the machine, you know it will just work. They also offer uh, complete customization, so you get uh, when you order a server, you fill out a form and you can specify how you want the BIOS configured, uh, what you want, you know, passwords to be, what uh, OS you want installed, how you want it configured. Uh, I take advantage of this to actually have them pre-configure a machine with its IP address and everything, so that rather than shipping it to me, they can ship it directly to the data center where it's going to live, and all it have, to, all the techs have to do is put the machine in the rack, uh, plug in power and Ethernet and it's up and running. And that's why you should check them out. Uh, they also have this white paper here that explains uh, some of the reasons, the 11 key traits that they provide that other vendors do not, and you should definitely consider them. In other news this week, uh, Microsoft has released their own custom-built uh, FreeBSD 10.3 image for the Azure Cloud. Importantly, uh, the big distinction here is that it includes support from Microsoft tech support. Uh, so they say, uh, this means not only can you quickly bring up a FreeBSD VM on Azure, you uh, also, uh, in the event that you need technical support, Microsoft support engineers can assist you. As you'll notice, Microsoft is the publisher of the FreeBSD image in the marketplace rather than the FreeBSD Foundation. The FreeB FreeBSD Foundation is supported by donations from the FreeBSD community, including companies that build their solutions on FreeBSD. Uh, they are not a solution provider or an ISV uh, with a support organization, but rather rely on a very active community that supports one another. In order to ensure our customers have an enterprise SLA for the FreeBSD VMs running in Azure Cloud, uh, we took uh, on the work of building, testing, and releasing and maintaining the image in order to remove this burden from the FreeBSD Foundation. We will continue to partner closely with the Foundation as we make further investments in FreeBSD on Hyper-V and in Azure. Uh, a quote from Justin Gibbs, the president of the FreeBSD Foundation, was, uh, it's quite a significant milestone for the FreeBSD community and for Microsoft to publish uh, a supported FreeBSD image in the Azure marketplace. We really appreciate Microsoft's commitment and investment in the FreeBSD project. So what Microsoft did was take a stock FreeBSD 10.3 release image and added additional patches, most of which have since been upstreamed, uh, but were too late for the, uh, the regular 10.3 release cycle. Uh, so these extra patches make FreeBSD more performant and work better in Azure and Hyper-V. So by building their own custom image, uh, they provide those additional fixes uh, without requiring users to run a snapshot of the stable branch or something, uh, which would complicate the user experience, making sure they get the right revision and they don't, you know, it's a moving target. Uh, and also it would complicate the job of Microsoft support engineers uh, because 
that would have a problem. Uh, and so they created their own certified release where they can uh, selectively, de selectively deploy additional errata fixes to the image as well. So if Microsoft finds out that, you know, with this tweak, uh, FreeBSD runs much better in Azure, they can uh, include that in their custom 10.3 image. Uh, what's not clear is how uh, update mechanisms and security updates work. I imagine if you use FreeBSD update on the Azure Cloud image and uh, update to you know FreeBSD 10.3 piece four, uh, you will lose some of the Microsoft customizations, and that might be problematic. Uh, I don't know if they've addressed that or not. Uh, interestingly, is the uh, the other interesting thing about all of this, including the Microsoft blog post which I've linked, is the uh, regular media coverage of it. Over at the register, they say Microsoft has created its own FreeBSD image. Repeat, Microsoft has created its own FreeBSD image. Uh, and they have a story about it as well. Uh, over at the Inquirer, they uh, talk about Microsoft creates its own distribution of FreeBSD for Azure developers. Wait, what? <laughs> uh, and uh, InfoWorld says Microsoft is now publishing its own FreeBSD. Yes or no? <laughs> or yes and no? Uh, because again, it is stock FreeBSD with just a few tweaks that missed the release cycle. Uh, and then I have so a bunch of additional links in here at the uh, different uh, websites reporting in different amusing ways on this particular uh, news item. Uh, lastly for this week, uh, we have a post from our friend Ted Unext, uh, who's talking about Select, the system call for uh, uh, monitoring a file descriptor and getting notified when something happens. So basically this allows a program to open up a bunch of files or a bunch of sockets and then go to sleep and say, wake me up when you know somebody writes to that file or some data comes in on that socket. Uh, so Ted posts, uh, at the bottom of the OpenBSD man page for select is a little note. It says, internally to the kernel, select and pselect work poorly if multiple processes wait on the same file descriptor. There's a similar warning in the pull man page. Uh, where does this warning come from and what does it mean? So Ted uh, found that at first glance, OpenBSD select appears to be quite bad. Uh, whenever some data gets written, we call wake up on the cell wait uh, wait channel, which all the select calls are waiting on. Based on what we've seen so far, one can conclude that it's likely to be inefficient. Every time any socket has some data available, we wake up every selecting process in the system. That works poorly indeed. But upon further investigation, it turns out to be not quite so bad. When the select uh, system call is first set up and you pass it the list of file descriptors, the process ID of the process that cares about that file descriptor is recorded in the cell info struct along with some other information. Uh, if a second process then runs select on the same file descriptor, like a socket or an open file or whatever, then the uh, collision flag is set uh, on the cell info struct. So then when data does come in on a socket, uh, then the cell wake up call is called and it checks. If the collision flag is set, then it has to uh, wake up all the selecting processes using that uh, wake up call. However, if the collision flag is not set, that means that only one process is waiting for something to happen on that socket or file descriptor. Uh, so in that case, uh, now that because it knows the PID via that information being stuffed in there when the select was set up, uh, the OpenBSD kernel can wake up that one uh, waiting process instead of all of them, greatly improving efficiency. Uh, Ted notes that this is not uh, an intractable problem. You could use something like K-Events to avoid it entirely. Uh, other implementations might solve the problem too. Uh, but practically, does it need to be solved? Um, what happens is when there is a collision, a counter called n cell call, so number of select collisions, gets incremented. Uh, and there's a sysctl you can use in the show notes here. It's uh, kern.ncell call um, is incremented. So by looking at this sysctl, you can see how many times uh, OpenBSD had to fall back to the worst behavior instead of the optimized behavior. Uh, on Ted's laptop, it only happened 43 times, which is small enough that it's probably not big of a deal. Uh, and on a server with substantially more uptime, it has happened zero times. I imagine in the end, it comes down to how much software still uses select versus using something more advanced like ePoll or uh, KQ and so on. Uh, next up, we have an interview uh, as soon as we finish with our sponsor. Uh, so our sponsor this week is DigitalOcean, uh, which is a cloud hosting provider that will provide you with a virtual machine to run uh, FreeBSD or pretty much any other OS you want uh, 
for as little as $5 a month. Uh, so for that $5 a month, you get 512 megabytes of memory, 20 gigabytes of SSD back storage, and an IP address. Uh, if you have multiple VMs like that, uh, you can use their floating IP feature to actually have a static IP that you can move between uh, virtual machines inside the same data center. This allows you to basically have uh, load balancing or failover or basically handle upgrades by moving the IP address from the original machine to the upgraded machine uh, without having to um, have any downtime or wait for DNS to propagate. When combined with the fact that you get free internal networking, so between your two VMs, uh, you can transfer data for free, uh, means that you could actually centralize on a single database server and then have the uh, two front ends with the floating IP flipping between them as you do upgrade your application stack, it means that you can make very simple high availability with only a few dollars a month of machines. Uh, they also offer team accounts. So if you have multiple people working at an organization, you can share an account uh, without having to share passwords. They also offer uh, different locations. Uh, each of them includes a speed test, so you can find out which one's best for you. But you can uh, host your VMs in Toronto, San Francisco, New York, London, Amsterdam, Singapore, Frankfurt, or their new data center in Bangalore, uh, India. They also have a complete API with command line tools or uh, a HTTP REST API so that you can automate the deployment of your virtual machines or turn up more capacity as you need it. Uh, when you do, it takes less than 55 seconds for a newly created VM to come up uh, because they have SSD-backed hard drives and you get uh, one terabyte per month of bandwidth is included with even the smallest VM and that number scales up as you buy more expensive ones. And you get full gigabit network capacity as well. And they have a 49s uptime SLA. Well, we're joined today by uh, Hans-Peter Salaski. Who's thank you. Here. First of all, yes, thank you for taking the time because we know it's a conference and there's a lot of exciting stuff happening downstairs, but we're up here so we can share with the rest of the world what you've been working on. Yeah, yeah. I'm ready for this moment to speak to the big audience. Right? <laughs> you have your microphone of the world now. So first of all, first time on the show, so you have to tell us about yourself a little bit first. Where did you uh, kind of get involved with BSD? What brought you to BSD? Well, that goes back uh, many, many years in time. Uh, I started out uh, when I was around 16 years old. I was looking for graphics drivers and mouse drivers and keyboard drivers to make a computer game, mm -hmm. and I found XORG. So back then, I had a choice among FreeBSD or Linux. So I decided to use FreeBSD, and the reason for that was the license. So I liked the FreeBSD license better than the Linux one. I, I felt it was not so selfish license. The GPL says you have to give back when you mm -hmm. change something. And I felt BSD was more of my thing I could use. So, so that is my early start of uh, FreeBSD. So I actually downloaded the FreeBSD distribution on floppies. Oh, wow. Using ISTM in Norway. So uh, I was sitting many, many hours just disk by disk by disk by disk. And I remember that I had a separate disk I could experiment with. So uh, I, when, when I had the installation done, the last disk, I, I noticed that the sound from the hard disk was so different than the other system. Well, I'm not going to tell what I used. It's embarrassing. Right. <laughs> So, but uh, uh, I noticed the first experience with FreeBSD was the disk sounded so different when it was loading and running fast and everything. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's my first experience with FreeBSD. It was through or something like that. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very early days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So, how did you then end up becoming a committed? Well, you know, it, it's not enough to only boot FreeBSD. You need to have FreeBSD on a network too. So in Norway, there was at this time no ADSL. Mm -hmm. So so I already had an ISDN plug and play running with my other system. And uh, I found out some other guys in Germany had made some ISDN stuff. And I, I started submitting patches for this kernel driver called ISDN for BSD. And 
Uh, in the end, I got to my ice jam drive on PPP working with FreeBSD. Nice. And uh, it wasn't enough, so, so I, I kind of started evolving. It was at the time uh, FreeBSD was getting multi threaded, mm -hmm. where they were moving away from SPL levels in the kernel and going full through mutexes. Sure. And uh, I kind of joined that wave, and I offered to 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 make uh, the ICM stack uh, so-called giant free. Mm -hmm. So, but but that was kind of my my experiment with FreeBSD that uh, I kind of rewrote clean the ICM stack in FreeBSD. It was never put upstream, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm not so worrying about that. Uh, so, but I, I still use it, uh, and I know a lot of other people use it, and uh, you, you know they can also interface it with analog phones. Sure. And uh, I, I made some adventures with Asterisk, Chan Copy, um, yeah, there, and also made some even a embedded device of my own, which runs not of any, anything of previous years, just a. Uh, STM32 processor with uh, interface towards uh, ISTM for BSD. So, hmm. yeah. Did you get your commit bit for doing that, or where did that eventually? The, the commit bit. Well, this is a really, really long story. So, the, the commit bit didn't come with the ISTM stuff. So, I, the ISTM stuff uh, really fascinated me. So. I started getting more devices. I wanted to support, you know, when you rewrite a stack, you need to also do the device drivers. Sure. And uh, then I was very proud. I made a giant free ISDM stack. And uh, I found out that there were some USB ISDM adapters available. Actually, a German company called Cologne Chip made them. Mm -hmm. and, and they sent me some demo samples. And uh, uh, I started working with USB ISDM, and then I found out that the USB stack was also giant locked, and it was a problem to interface a non-giant locked API with a giant locked one. So it was just backwards races and sure. stuff like that. So so. I started uh, rewriting parts of the uh, USB stack, and I was pushing hard on the mailing list. Mm -hmm. Here's the latest USB stack, version 2.0. You can try it out, download patches, talk and about USB for BSD. Right? Yeah, USB for BSD. I remember, I remember we pulled those patches in the PC BSD like very early in the early days. Like we needed better USB support. So. Yeah, it was crashing when you unplug devices and yeah. all of that. So. So uh, yeah, so 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 after pushing hard, harder and harder and hardest mm -hmm. for a couple of years, uh, finally someone sat down. Okay, you need a commit bit. You can push this upstream. You're usable to the product. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so that was how I got into FreeBSD source uh, kernel commits. And, and since that, uh, it's, it's just evolved, like the one API interfaces with another API, so, so I kind of just grown in the kernel that it was USB, and then I found out USB network devices, USB serial ports, USB mass storage, USB audio, so, so every single of these uh, drivers interface with some other API in the FreeBSD kernel. And, and, and this way, I, I learned to know a lot of the APIs in the kernel, how they work, what's bad, what's good. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and uh, yeah, I believe I've become an all-rounder mm -hmm. in the FreeBSD kernel. And uh, during my latest adventures, uh, I've been working now in a dangerous network stack in FreeBSD. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, there's a company now that pay my bills. It's named Mellanox, and uh, they're making 100 gigabit network adapters. And uh, I've been working to improve 
optimized uh, the network driver they got for FreeBSD. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's interesting because they're so fast, packets are going so fast that every single bug or every single race there is in, in, in the network stack gets exposed. Sure. And uh, this happened to me, I think it was not two years ago, one or two years ago. Uh, we had a strange crash in the network stack where some timers went crazy. And uh, after thorough investigation, uh, I found out it's a race inside the timer subsystem. And, hmm. and uh, I had to really convince people, is there really a race in the timer subsystem? A lot of people said, no, 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 that can't be, it's free BSD, you know, right. but it's not better. <laughs> so, so I had to really write a proof of concept. I was feeling like a criminal, you know, writing exploit code for free BSD kernel subsystem. <laughs> so, but in the end, I, I finally made my point, and, and some other people, I think it was Randall that uh, fixed the issue in the end. So so yeah and then yeah so I started somewhere and I'm now here yeah right yeah that's uh, the nice thing about a project the biggest previous is you know you start with ISDN or USB and you end up all of the place yes. you can wander around until you find like one that you really love right yeah so <laughs> it, it's just like a big big virtual world where you can kind of always find the area which interests you or where you can contribute um, uh, and then also uh, what comes next is that you know to learn the people behind the code too. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that a lot of people are still alive but are getting older mm -hmm. so so uh, I would say that if you're watching this show you should join up for a conference and meet the people, talk to them and hear their views and opinions and and um, how they want the kernel to be. Sure. Yeah, it's like the talk we just came from earlier. Uh, someone asked a question about, you know, well, why doesn't it work like this? And, and the presenter was like, well, the guy sitting two seats over from you is who wrote it originally. You should talk to him. Right. Yeah. So so it's it's uh, it's like you, you have your own coding style. You know, in previous it's pretty much the same, usually, except for vendor code. I love vendor code. So, you so have your well, sort of. So, so uh, if we're going back to this uh, network adventure, so, so uh, I did uh, some work with uh, porting something called OFED mm -hmm. to FreeBSD. It's basically uh, for InfiniBand that they have a stack that supports InfiniBand. Do you know what InfiniBand is? Vaguely. Vaguely. So, I maybe want to advocate InfiniBand a little bit. So, it's, it's sort of similar to USB. Mm -hmm. uh, some people won't like me comparing InfiniBand with USB, but I'm doing it anyway. So, <laughs> it, it's like this that y you have a hardware control of retransmissions. Mm -hmm. so, so, you have a non lossy connection, and, and the hardware takes care of retransmission. Almost similar to USB. So, so when you have something called a boot endpoint in USB, it means that the data you you put into the device, uh, if you have a packet loss, CRC error, or failure, it, the hardware will retransmit it. You don't have to do it in software like you do sure. with TCP. Mm -hmm. and, and and this allows you to to kind of get the latency down to the micros. That that. that it, that, that, uh, but, but it also has some disadvantages that you need to allocate a route through through the switches to your final destination mm -hmm. and, and, and then if you have a packet lost between two nodes it will be retransmitted there and not between the peers. Sure. And, and, and that way you can have really high transfer rates. Uh, we're talking gigabits, tens of gigabits and mm -hmm. even now hundreds of gigabits. For a single connection, and uh, you have really low latency on, uh, yeah. So, but it's well, it's a different kind of thing. It's more for really, really 
high performance if, if you're I don't know. Is like video and stuff like yeah, that? Yeah, if you're making your own broadcast or maybe not like you are, but, right. but if you're at a TV studio with sure. a bunch of stuff, maybe you need Infinibound mm -hmm. there to, to move the content around. Sure. Well, it's also popular for like external storage and stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. right. Um, right. There was recently a guy, Justin Cliff, that was making some patches for Freenas to improve uh, Infinibound support, and I uh, actually was involved fixing a bug in uh, IP over Infiniband that it works now with uh, vImage. Hmm. Okay. There was a missing uh, piece of code to set the current vImage, hmm. and that was panicking. Okay. Very cool. So tell us a bit about your music stuff you've been doing on BSD. I know USB, but also you've done a lot of audio work. Yeah, sure. So, so that's kind of one of my hobbies. I, I like to play the piano. Mm -hmm. And uh, many years ago, or actually it's three, four, five, no, it's, it's more, it's 10 years ago. Wow. <laughs> 10 years ago, I, I, I had this idea that I'm a programmer. Uh, I know how I can do to play the piano, but I cannot play it by hand, but maybe by a computer. I can play it. So I started out to experiment to make some mini software that kind of loop uh, the key presses from the piano to the computer real time and, and process it and loop it back. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of made my own uh, piano that it, it reorder all the keys uh, real time. And, and then even an amateur can play the piano, but, sure. but, but, but not everyone, I found out. So, so, so you, you need to be a little rhythmic in your body. If you're not rhythmic, then you, you don't play music. Right. So, so, so I had a lot of fun with that. And, uh, this kind of evolved into almost a karaoke solution where you have text scrolling on a second screen while mm -hmm. you're playing the piano. So it's really cool. It's called MIDI Player Pro. And I actually used a QT uh, graphics library to, mm -hmm. to, to, to design this tool. And I never regretted that. It's almost a region tool. Yay, I'm mm -hmm. from Norway. <laughs> so, so I learned a lot about QT, real-time programming, uh, and also cross-platform. So sure. uh, I managed to compile this software on, on iPad and Mac and Linux and FreeBSD, and, and that's it for now. Mm -hmm. No Windows port? Well, you said the bad word now, so oh, okay. I was thinking about it, but then I thought, well, there's so much privacy and copying, and uh, mm -hmm. I don't care. If you want to use my software, use Mac, Linux, FreeBSD, iPad, yeah. There you go. Or FreeBSD. Yeah. Yeah. I said FreeBSD. We'll say it. Thanks for FreeBSD. That's the one you should do. Yes. Yeah. 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 Very cool. Uh, and so you've also done a lot of work with other USB stuff like WebcamD. Yeah. That started out a few years ago too, that there was no good webcam support in FreeBSD. So I started out with some work that Luigi had done for the kernel. He, he, he made some USB wrappers so that you could compile some, some uh, drivers, USB drivers. Uh, and uh, I kind of moved all of that into user space. Uh, so so you, you kind of wrap the Linux USB kernel APIs behind libUSB. Mm -hmm. And uh, you also emulate the character devices you need through uh, Q's library. And uh, uh, then you simply compile the Linux code more or less as is with, with a few patches. Uh, I even made my own uh, parser for the um, KMake files that it will quickly parse them and, and figure out uh, configuration keywords which files you're supposed to, to build and not. And uh, uh, that works pretty well. 
Uh, in the beginning, I, I had releases like every month or so, but, but now it's uh, almost every half a year. I update the Linux, update this Linux kernel mm -hmm. code from Linux to our repository, extract that, uh, make sure it builds, do some tests. And uh, at, at home, I'm actually using uh, a DVB uh, T uh, USB adapter to watch mm -hmm. TV with FreeBSD. So, mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, I'm one of those uh, VDR free VSD users. What other software do you use? Just out of curiosity, because I've had people ask me that before, and I don't always have a good answer for them. Like, how do you do that on your uh, how, how how do you do that? Well, well, I make some custom scripts of my own to to kind of uh, do encoding of videos, recording, and so on, mm -hmm. and present it on a dynamically generated web page. And uh, I, I tested out TV head, and it was a bit slow because, uh, at least with satellite reception, because the way it processed the channel, so with satellite, you know, maybe thousands of channels mm -hmm. and, and stuff, and, it, it uh, was a bit slow, so I ended up that VDR was for now the best way to do it. I know other people use Myth TV. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't try that myself yet. And XPMC, some people use. Uh, there are many options, so it depends what you, uh, how you want to use it. So, so I have like a TV computer mm -hmm. in my home and. Uh, some other people used it as well, living there, and uh, it works pretty well. So, so I, I use mostly VLC for viewing TV, and it's on a not, not high-end uh, pro processor. So, so you might get some occasional frame drops or something, but sure. but it, it it's not it's comfortable, you know. It's yeah. uh, it's working just fine and. Audio is good, and, and it, yeah, so so so, and I, I like to run FreeBSD on it. So, it, and, and that's why I found out that it's not just buying a USB device. You need to sometimes look at who make it. Mm -hmm. Is it really solid? Can, can it work 24/7 for mm -hmm. several weeks? Uh, that kind of stuff will show up. If you do this kind of thing, that that uh, you find out there's also software and decide to use a device, yeah. and over time you will see maybe it crashes because there's something wrong, memory leak, or mm -hmm. you know. So 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 it might be you have to first buy something to try, then buy something else, and and then you will find something that you can trust uh, and use for a long time. Mm -hmm. Do you have any of this information published somewhere so people can find out? Or yeah, there is some scripts? information on wiki.freebsd.org somewhere, webcam decompact something. Mm -hmm. There's a list of supported devices, and usually it's devices that people work, uh, not, are known to work. And uh, yeah, so, so that also brings me into the topic of SDR, software defined radio. Mm -hmm. So I, I know some people use new radio, which and I know because they use USB dongles to do this. And uh, it, it works pretty well. I tried it myself, receive AM radio, decode it in software, FM radio, decode it in software. Mm -hmm. So it, it's very fun. You can do a lot of cool stuff there if you're interested in radio technology. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, uh, for webcam D, I know that all the Logitech webcams, like C910, 920, 930, work very well under FreeBSD with mm -hmm. webcam D. Yeah, that's that's true. So, so uh, it even got me interested to make some old software. It's, it's not in post yet, but it's in, it's in the public uh, stream I've got. So, so basically, what I did, uh, it's almost professional. <laughs> So yeah, it is professional, you, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so so it, it's like a small demon. Uh, you, you open up uh, a number of webcams. You can even record from X. Like mm -hmm. you can select a window. It should snapshot. Mm -hmm. 
Sure. And you can have one audio device source. And the whole point of this software is to synchronize that you have the same amount of pictures per second mm -hmm. per audio frame. So, so that when you want to, uh, uh, when you want to, uh, what's it called, edit the videos mm -hmm. and change the angle and so on uh, afterwards. Sure. You, 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 everything is in lip sync, sort of. Right. So, so, so wow. it, 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 and I, I used it to make some demo videos for my music software, so you, you can almost see that when I press the key on the piano, the sound arrives. Yeah. And it, it works across different angles. So, so this software is still it's in, in the beginning of development, but it's still smart enough to buffer up, so, so, so that if you have a slow disk, uh, it won't um, kind of uh, fall behind, fall behind uh, too much. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, I'm, but I didn't implement like MPEG-2 compression or anything like that yet. So, if you need a big fat disk, and, sure. and you get AVI files with uh, everything. And I, I tried to experiment a bit using Blender 3D for video editing, and it, mm -hmm. it worked. That was cool. Cool. That's very neat. So, 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 is that available in ports already, or is it packaged? Well, if you go to my ISDN for BSD SVN, you, you'll okay. find it there. I don't remember where I named it. It's some uh, webcam recorder or something. Okay. You have to go through it. Mm -hmm. It's a good project. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned a little bit, uh, especially as it relates to OFED and the Mellanox driver, the Linux KPI work you did. Can you tell us a bit about that? Sure. So, so as I'm already familiar with uh, porting Linux webcam drivers and DVB stuff and user space, mm -hmm. it kind of was a good match for me to work with the Linux KPI in the kernel, which basically is uh, a bunch of wrappers for uh, mutexes, threads, uh, chart devices, uh, K objects, uh, a bunch of things that allows you to compile more or less Linux network code as is. Sure. And used it with FreeBSD. Sure. And uh, we tried to stay clear of licensing issues. Mm -hmm. So we, we 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 don't keep comments in the code, except for our own. We, we try to make it clean, so we don't just copy Linux code into the FreeBSD kernel. Sure. And. Uh, uh, and uh, for renders that uh, make network drivers and Linux, this comes very useful when they want to publish a BSD licensed uh, hybrid driver that has one lag in the Linux kernel and the other lag in the BSD world. Hmm. And uh, well, I would wish that it was all native FreeBSD. But uh, we're not alone in the world, sure. so and, and I, I think uh, building bridges is a good thing. That that making uh, developers understand how other operating systems do things might help produce better cross-platform code in the future. Mm -hmm. So so maybe next time a vendor starts a network driver. They will use experiences from using the Linux KPI to, 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 to make code that's more or less universal between Linux and FreeBSD. Yeah, very cool. I think in some cases it's the only way for us to get some of these drivers. Yeah. Places where we don't maybe have enough influence with the vendor to make them do a FreeBSD version. They're like, right. I already did a open source driver, that's good enough, right? And then just kind of leave yeah, it. yeah, that makes me think about the uh, state of graphics uh, drivers mm -hmm. in FreeBSD. And uh, I heard some rumors that uh, a guy is porting the latest i915 driver yes. on Linux uh, to FreeBSD. We just interviewed him two weeks ago. We interviewed him two weeks ago. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So I have it on my laptop right here. It's running. <laughs> yeah. So so I'm just thinking, you know, what laptop to buy, and you know, trying to figure out something that works well. Sure. Well, hopefully, very soon the answer will be any of them. Yeah. From a video standpoint, anyway, yes. like you're good. Yeah. Yeah. So Wi-Fi, maybe not so much. Yeah. It it, it makes a difference. Yeah, 
Mm -hmm. So then I can maybe throw my USB Wi-Fi down, but I think I won't throw it. I like USB too much, so right. it's still, <laughs> still be USB Wi-Fi on my lap. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. so but, but I think we're different. Some people would want uh, built-in to work as well. Sure. Yeah. That does hurt. So, but uh, and that reminds me, I, I have to put a small shot towards Apple, you know, because they actually started out with USB webcams in their laptops. But then they change it to a PCI proprietary device. And I don't like that. No, no. I think I have to stick with USB webcam drivers. Yeah. yeah, that would make me more happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Well, this has been fantastic. Anything else you want to tell us really quick as we wrap up? <sighs> well, well, 3 is cool, and I hope some of you watching maybe get uh, get some more ideas that you can do a lot of hobby things and also professional work with FreeBSD. Mm -hmm. So it's a big world and yeah, I, I hope some of you get uh, uh, inspired to, to do some coding also, not just complain about missing features, but sure. getting into the code. Shut up and code. That's right. So we, we need more developers and also testers, mm -hmm. so that uh, can can help out, especially with this Linux KPI project. It would be cool to see more people involved uh, in the code base, understanding mm -hmm. things, and also talking to the Linux guys because it happens from time to time that we find some bug and want to push a patch upstream Linux, and then it's nice to have some mm -hmm. contacts there. So. We can tell them we have a little better playground for you now to bring your Linux stuff over. Like, yeah. You're not completely foreign. You have the KPI. Yeah, in particular, it's, you know, if you happen to know a lot about Linux, we could use your help. <laughs> right? That would yeah, be yeah, sure, sure. So we're, we're kind of building a big bridge now towards mm -hmm. Linux. And, uh, and uh, I think I would like to say that if you're debugging in Linux kernel, don't come to free VST. Debugging in user space is so much better than debugging in the kernel. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. We appreciate you being here. Yes, yeah. uh, thank you. you. Next, our sponsor, Tarsnap. Um, so if you're not backing up your files with Tarsnap, you really should be. Uh, because it encrypts the data before it leaves your computer, because the source code of the client is available so you can download it, audit it yourself, and compile it yourself. You know it doesn't contain anything that you didn't check. And because it does deduplication of your data. So you only charge for the amount of unique data that ends up being sent up uh, to the cloud store. Because it's encrypted uh, before it goes and your keys never leave your possession, it means that no one in the cloud, not Colin, not Amazon, no one, uh, can ever read your data. And, uh, you know, if you want it to cease to be in the cloud, all you have to do is destroy that key, and that data is now completely unusable by anyone. On their website, they have this uh, great chart that kind of walks through how the process works. And you can see, it looks at your data set. In this case, they have uh, 700 and, or 7.5 gigs of data, uh, but comparing that to the previous backup, there's only 2.2 gigs of unique data. Once that's compressed, deduplicated, and signed, it turns out to only be 0.81 megabytes. And so you upload those blocks, and that costs less than a cent because you have so little data. And then, uh, aside from the uploading and the uh, storage, uh, which even at 15 gigabytes adds up to less than $4 a month, it means all your files are safely in the cloud uh, and unable to be used by an attacker or anyone else but there if you want to restore them. Uh, at BSD Can, I met quite a few people who've uh, saved their files uh, from certain disaster by pulling them back out of Tarsnap at the opportune moment. So in our Beastie Bits Roundup section, uh, we have a number of stories here. The first one is a timeline of the libxbat uh, random vulnerability that happened on OpenBSD. And there's a timeline here, uh, starting back in 2012 in March, where libxpat 2.1.0 was released with a fix for an algorithmic hash table attack. Uh, it used uh, uses RAND, seeded by SRAND time null, to obtain the uh, hash table salt. 
Uh, a few weeks, uh, about a week later, uh, expat 2.1.0 is imported to OpenBSD. The RAND call was replaced with ARC4 random, um, as spotted by um, Deirdre Rat and uh, Nick M. April Fool's Day. <laughs> uh, a public report uh, that using random may not uh, may be too predictable was released uh, a few days later. Then 2013 and 2014 happened with no further information. Then in February of 2015, Red Hat uh, filed a bug. The complaint is not that RAND is a poor choice for secret salts, but that calling SRAND interferes with proper uh, malfunctioning of other RAND consumers. Followed finally by in June 4th of 2016, LibExpat is the proud recipient of two more CVE awards. By sheer miraculous luck, OpenBSD is not susceptible. Users of other operating systems need not be alarmed as expat has been patched to use getpid as a source of entry AP as well. Um, lessons to be learned. Sometimes bad things happen and there's nothing we can do to prevent them. <laughs> Which I think is actually quite sarcastic in that, uh, in that it, most of this was in fact preventable. Then over on Hacker News, we have the question, do you use FreeBSD as a web server? Why or why not? Uh, and many users provide their opinions on why they do or do not use open, uh, FreeBSD as their web server. It's quite an interesting read, and uh, I think people will enjoy it. Uh, interestingly, it turns out that uh, Hacker News itself is powered by FreeBSD web servers. Then over on uh, Christer Wolfridson's blog, uh, he talks about 20 years of code bloat on NetBSD. He actually... Uh, starts comparing uh, the fact that he's running the same software that he did back when he started using NetBSD 20 years ago, which is GCC, Emacs, X11, and FVWM. Uh, and uh, the size of most of those things have expanded quite a bit. You know, uh, GCC 2.7.2 uh, on as shipped with NetBSD 1.2 had a text segment size of about a megabyte whereas the GCC 4.8.5 used today is about 11 megabytes. Uh, and then even libc grew from 330 kilobytes uh, to 1.4 megabytes. So uh, he started looking at the NetBSD build process and started making some graphs, uh, comparing the size of libc on i386 versus Sun3. And you can see that over time it has grown, but the i386 one has grown more. Libm is uh, stayed about the same between the two architectures, but the kernel has changed drastically. On uh, i386, the NetBSD kernel is approaching 16 megabytes, but for Sun3, it is currently around 2 megabytes. I'm guessing a lot of that is device drivers, uh, where i386 has grown very broad and Sun3 has probably stayed very narrow. Uh, he plans to do some additional investigation, so we will check back on his blog and see uh, what he comes up with. And another user here has uh, posted about getting the uh, HP Chromebook 13-inch uh, booting OpenBSD, which is uh, quite a useful accomplishment. And you can see it here, starting up with uh, OpenBSD. Although it doesn't appear to be using the entire resolution of the screen. Uh, next up, we have an interesting uh, PDF here. Uh, Unix for Poets. This is actually a presentation that was given uh, for a linguist class, uh, but it teaches the basics of Unix, uh, which is important. Uh, you know, a lot of users, especially that are fairly new to the command line, will find this very helpful. Uh, so it does some various exercises like count the number of words in a text file or sort a list of words in various ways, like ASCII sort versus rhyming order and so on. Uh, or extracting useful information from a dictionary, or computing statistics about parts of words, and uh, so on. So it talks about you know basic tools like grep, sort, unique, tr, word count, sed, cat, echo, cut, paste, head, tail, uh, rev, com, join, and shuffle. Uh, so in this example, they show how you can uh, log into their shell system, copy this text file to your home directory, and then use the man page for TR uh, to start learning about it and how the basic uh, input, output, and pipe commands work and control C to cancel stuff. 
So the first exercise is to take that input text file and list uh, and get a list of words with the frequency count. So they use the tokenizer, TR, to split uh, each word into its own line, then use sort to group all words that are the same, and then use unique minus C for count to give us a count of how many words, uh, how many times a word appears. So looking at this, we can see that the letter A appears uh, 25,000 times, uh, whereas the word aardvark appears twice, and uh, owlborg appears only once. Um, and you can see similar things. Uh, then you can use head to get, say, just the first 10 lines. Or you could sort with the minus N flag uh, to sort by the number of matches and instead of alphabetically, and so on, and so on. Uh, and then they look at merging upper and lower cases together and downcasing everything so that you get uh, more detail. Or uh, how to, you know, how common are different sequences of vowels? Uh, so, you know, using another TR command to sort by those. And then it shows how to uh, sort, sort ignoring case, uh, how to sort numerically, how to sort backwards, how to do reverse numeric sort, and so on. Uh, or using the rev command to actually print text backwards. Uh, so here they do some examples like finding the 50 most common words used in the New York Times uh, corpus they have there. Or find the words in the New York Times corpus that end with the letter ZZ. Uh, and they show both piping commands together and, and so on and so on. Uh, it's a very good uh, presentation, especially if you're a new user. It kind of walks you through a lot of the stuff. Although I'm guessing the uh, if it had a video to go with it, it would be a little easier because some of the stuff is uh, is not quite explained in the text because this is a presentation rather than you know a, a tutorial. Uh, next up, we have uh, interesting over at DistroWatch. They compared the live up live version upgrade method uh, between Debian, Fedora, FreeBSD, OpenSUSE, and Ubuntu, uh, and they basically walked through each of those different uh, Linux upgrades and how they went, and then compared that to FreeBSD. Uh, they did compare a major version upgrade, so say going from FreeBSD 9 to 10, uh, which is a bit more complicated than say just going from nine uh, from 10.2 to 10.3, uh, which would have um, yeah, made their upgrade process quite a bit easier and avoided the uh, particular pitfall of the FreeBSD upgrade process, which is the updating of the uh, ETC files. Uh, Hopefully that that's uh, going to be addressed with the new packaging base system, which will come out in FreeBSD 11.1. But it's definitely worth a read. Uh, and uh, you know, if there's a particular problem with the upgrade process that you have, we'd love to have your contributions to work those out. Lastly, we have a Reddit thread about a user who switched from Linux to BSD for his uh, Lenovo ThinkPad X220, which is a slightly older laptop now. It's Sandy Bridge, but I have two of them and like them very much. Uh, and he basically shows his experience, and there's an ongoing discussion about it, including uh, in there are some uh, extra settings to uh, extend the battery life of that particular machine a little bit, uh, and some talk about the wireless, which is the uh, Intel 6205, which works very well under the IWN driver on FreeBSD, uh, and some other discussion, but it's definitely worth taking a look at. But that's all we have this week for our slightly shorter show. Uh, Chris will be back next week, and we'll be back to having our regular show. Uh, in the meantime, if you have any questions, comments, ideas for uh, things to do on the show or topics to talk about or people we should interview or a story you would like us to mention on the show, please email us at feedback at bsdnow.tv. Uh, thank you for watching, and we will see you next week. <laughs>